we didn't have money to buy cars. When I was living in Cheshire, I took the bus into Stockport, the 28, from Bramwell to Stockport. I took the 26 from Stockport to Rusholm, and from Rusholm I took the 53 to uh, Manchester City uh, Main Road. But it was fun going on buses, you know, being one of the community. While Bert's career was going from strength to strength, a little girl was growing up in Lancashire with no idea that Manchester City's goalkeeper was her real father. After Bert had walked out on his girlfriend Marion and baby daughter Frida, Marion had met and married another man, and as she grew up, Frida had always assumed that he was her father. But one day at school, all that changed. This boy, Ian, came up to me and said, my mum said that that man that you you live with is not your real dad. So I just more or less said, yes, he is. How do you know? My mum's told me that he's not your real dad. So I went home, and that, that's the first thing I blurted out at my mum when I got home is, Ian, such a body said that he's not my dad. It took a while for Marion to reveal the truth to Frida, but eventually she gave in. So she sat me down and she told me that um, it was Bert Troutman and um, that he played for Man City. And she sort of informed me all about what happened. And sort of to think that this was my father, but how do I get to him? Meanwhile, Manchester City were enjoying another successful FA Cup run and in March 1956 were drawn against Spurs in the semi-final. It was to prove a controversial match. City were winning 1-0 when, in the last minute, Spurs had a final attack and Bert had a tussle with their striker in the goal mouth. Not much work for Bert Troutman in the City goal, though Spurs do make a despairing last-minute effort. Tottenham were in possession of the ball, they were attacking. Troutman jumps and pulls the ball down. George Robb has a chance but loses it. Unfortunately, uh, one of my arms went around his leg. It could have been, if the referee would have seen it, should have been a penalty. And in extra time we could have lost the game and we wouldn't have been at the cup final. Bert's actions might well have denied Spurs a place in the cup final, and their fans were furious. Bert was inundated with hate mail, but one letter went further than any other. And he quoted uh, saying, you robbed uh, Tottenham Hotspur, you know, uh, going into the final. It should have been a penalty and uh, the outcome would have been clear. We would have lost the game, and for that I'm going to penalise you one way or the other, and I'm going to stand behind the goal with a gun. This was a threat. And so when Bert stepped out onto the Wembley turf for the cup final two months later, the death threat was still hanging over his head. But he had no idea just how close he would come to losing his life that day. On the 5th of May, 1956, Manchester City goalkeeper Bert Troutman walked out onto the Wembley pitch, not knowing whether amongst the crowd of 100,000 spectators was a crazed gunman who threatened to shoot him. Birmingham City and Manchester City came out into the billiard table arena together. The tall, blonde Manchester goalkeeper Bert Troutman, a conspicuous figure. From the tunnel coming out, you think about uh, the person who sent you the letter going to kill you. Would the fellow stand there to, to uh, put his uh, threat into action? But once you, I think, once the game started, then you don't think about it. So, Manchester, kick off. Birmingham's inside left, Peter Murphy, starts an attack, which sweeps to the Manchester goal mouth and straight into the arms of Bert Troutman, one of the world's greatest goalkeepers. City dominated the game and were leading 3-1 when, with 17 minutes to go, 
came one of the most infamous incidents in Wembley history. Birmingham rally and then a clash between Peter Murphy and goalie Bert Troutman. Troutman's hurt. Let's have a look at that collision in slow motion. Diving at Murphy's feet, the former German paratrooper and POW suddenly collects a nasty one. I knew, I knew on that occasion that he was badly hurt. I felt helpless at the time. I felt as if I wanted to do something for him and I couldn't. If you see the photograph, you see me just stand there. And I'm looking at him, just thinking, well, I, the same thought going through my mind. He's got to be badly injured. Bill was right to be concerned, because although nobody realised it at the time, Bert had broken his neck. Second cervical of the vertebrae was broken diagonal. Through the impact of the thigh, the third one pushed itself under the second and held the two pieces together. A hundredth of a millimetre. And I would have either been dead or paralysed. One of the two things. Bert could easily have lost his life at that moment. And then he continued, but not only did he continue for the, the last minutes of the game, with all of us sitting there going, oh my goodness, he's, he's really hurt, but it was the fact that he then went in head first again. Over Dave Ewing's head, and Troutman's game as ever. Injured or not, he's determined to pull his weight. Back to his goal and ready for more. I played on in a kind of fog, grey. I didn't realise any, I didn't see no figures, no nothing. I was very, very lucky. The final whistle, victory for Manchester City, and congratulations all round. After the match, Bill Leavers led Bert from the pitch. Bert was still in a daze as he collected his winner's medal. And any pat on the back from an unsuspecting fan might well have killed him. Two days later, the cup-winning team paraded the trophy in Manchester, and Bert, who still didn't know that he'd broken his neck, received a hero's welcome. The ex-Nazi paratrooper, once vilified by the fans, was now the people's champion. The team reached the town hall, where a civic welcome awaits them from Lord Mayor Tom Regan. But the crowd don't want speeches, they want their hero, Bert Trapman. Bert can't get a word in either. Quiet, quiet, quiet. Quiet! <laughs> The Manchester Parade crowned a happy few weeks for Bert, as he'd also been named Footballer of the Year, the first goalkeeper ever to receive the award. It wasn't until the Wednesday after the Cup final that Bert went to hospital for an X-ray. And with the true extent of his injuries finally revealed, the doctors were taking no chances. They drilled holes in my head, they put uh, calipers into my skull and I was lying on boards, wooden boards, for three weeks. Bert was placed in a plaster cast that covered his body from his head to his waist and told that he might never play football again. Then, a month after he'd begun his recuperation, his son John was hit by a car and killed. He was just five years old. It was quite an ordeal. And my wife never recovered from that shock because she saw the accident. She saw, you know, as he was thrown in the air. And she never recovered. She lost... Uh, she didn't want to live. And she died of a broken heart. You know, we tried. We had two more boys later on. We discussed things. Didn't take long, three years, and uh, she never bothered about anything. 
must be terrible for any person to see your own child being thrown into the air, you know. And uh, that's it, that's how I lost my wife, yes. It took Bert six months to recover from his injury, but to ease the pain of losing his son, he threw himself back into football and, against medical advice, played his first game on Christmas Day 1956. It wasn't long before he'd forced his way back into the Manchester City first team, and although he struggled at times, he ended up playing better than he'd ever played before. Burke finally hung up his boots in 1964 at the age of 42. And after a brief spell in management, he spent 16 years travelling the world, coaching third world teams with the German Football Association, and took Burma to the Olympics in 1972. Later, he set up the Burke Troutman Foundation, a charity whose aim has been to nurture Anglo-German relationships through football. A fitting role for the Nazi paratrooper who fell in love with England. In 2004, he was awarded the OBE for his work. Today, Bert has remarried and lives happily in Spain with his wife. But there's also another woman in his life. Because in 1990, with the help of a national newspaper, Bert and his daughter Frida were reunited. It's something beautiful. It's like we've never missed a day. And we love each other very much so. My life's complete now. I think if I'd never met him, there'd always be that in the back of your mind. So what if? But I don't need to worry about that now because the what if is a reality. And after their happy reunion, Frieda arranged for Bert to meet up with her mother, Marion, the girl he jilted 42 years before. And when I came in, he just stood up and he put his arms around me and gave me a kiss. And I come in here and he come in here with me. And then we had a little talk there. And I said, I want you to know, I've never felt anything bad about you, you know, things like that, which I've not. I didn't all end it against him, because I loved him, and I still do in different, you know, a different way now, but uh, I'll, I'll uh, always feel that way about him, always. It's been a long journey for Bert Troutman, from the streets of Bremen to Wembley glory and beyond and he's left an indelible mark on many of those whose lives he's touched along the way. I think Bert is a truly remarkable man, actually. I think he's a survivor like no one else. Having a talent like that is natural, but you have to have heart and courage with it. And I think he's got masses of heart and masses of courage. He just had this presence about him, and that, that of course, singles out the great goalkeeper from the very, very good goalkeeper. And the word great gets banded around too much, but Bert was truly greatness, absolute greatness. He, he means so much to me, Bert. He's my hero, he's, he's uh, I love the guy. And today, more than 65 years after he first arrived as a prisoner of war, Bert still has a love affair with England where he's always greeted as a hero. I can't say it often enough. The way I was treated from being a POW via St. Helens Town, via Mancunians, via people of Great Britain. I'm more English than German, yes, even though I was born German. <laughs> 